There we go. It's official. <laughs> and, and I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight and joining us again. We're at Creative Real Estate University. You can find us on our Facebook group as well as our YouTube channel. So please check out both and like and subscribe in that YouTube channel. We're trying to get our viewers up over there. We, we have a lot to offer. So please, please take a look. And um, our special guest today is Libby. Libby actually and Cindy and I go back quite a ways. We were talking about mobile home parks and RV parks um, months ago. And come to find out, Libby, as a member of our community, has also had some experience owning and operating a campground. And we're like, that would be a fabulous show. And what a great story her and her husband have about uh, getting this campsite, campground, and, and turning it around. So, Libby, we greatly appreciate your time and coming yeah. in and sharing your story. All right. Especially with a, a fellow Michigander. So Yeah, yeah. And Michigan has lots of campgrounds. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, the, the famous saying, once you're a campground owner is, uh, so you want to buy a campground. Everybody says it's going to be so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> so just a little bit of a background uh, on me. I have been married for 34 years uh, come this Saturday. And um, on the left there is my wonderful husband who um, has given me a lot of freedom to pursue real estate investing and other things since we sold our campground. And uh, he is a general contractor as well as a uh, past engineer for the automotive industry. And so all that knowledge came in real handy as we were developing our campground. We have four children, uh, 29 year old triplets and a uh, uh, afterthought that was a complete surprise. He literally came along 15 months after the triplets. So we mm -hmm. had four kids under 15 months. Oh um, my. And then they all got married uh, 10 months apart. So on the right wow. hand side, you see my uh, dozen lovely grandchildren sure. with the um, 13th, which makes it a baker's dozen there uh, in the oven. Oh, wow. So this is why you got a campground is to house everybody. Yeah, well, I did have a campground no longer. We we thought that they were going to all have a blast on it, but then we ended up selling it. So <sighs> my background is I was a physical therapist, um, spent 10 years as a director of rehab services for inpatient and outpatient therapies at our hospital. Um, when we first got married, we initially bought a duplex, lived in half, rented out the other half, renovated it, refinanced it, bought a house, again, lived in it, refine, you know, rehabbed it, refinanced it, bought another duplex, and then bought another house. After about eight years, uh, decided that he was working 60 hours a week for the automotive industry. Uh, four kids under three years old was a very busy uh life at home and it just got to be a little bit too much to have to take care of that. So we ended up selling those off, sold the house we were living in and built kind of our dream home. And uh, after about six years thought, you know, here we have the dream home, 20 acres, the pole barn, we're kind of bored. There's gotta be more to life. What can we do? And uh, out of that was born the idea of the campground. And I can see that my slides came in kind of wonky. Um, so I apologize for that. They looked good in Canva. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> so what happened is in 2004, um, we basically said, what can we do as a family? You know, what, our boys loved being outside. Um, our girls were good, were good with people. We always were kind of a family that liked hospitality. And uh, the idea of a campground was was born. And we were initially going to buy a campground, but at the time, um, it was much like now, uh, there was a lot of campgrounds for sale. The price was very high. Um, and just none of them, the numbers matched up. So in 2005, we decided to buy the property that his parents had 60 acres of land over in a little teeny town called Covert. And it is Covert. You pass through and you won't even know you were there. Uh, but it happens to be just a few miles off of Lake Michigan in between um, four major resort towns that attract a lot of tourists. 
And so we decided to build the campground there. Um, initially, we were going for financing in late 2005, a month before we got the financing, the bank backed out on us. It brought the whole project to a halt for about a year until we could get the financing again. And uh, so then we really started gun ho in the fall of 2006 and opened nine months later in on May 18th of 2007. Promptly opened up, had all that new baby grass. And uh, the next weekend had absolute gushing, gushing downpours. The, you know, you don't know what you don't know about water management until you have that. And so half the campground was underwater and had a oh, lot wow. of experiences, a lot of tears, <laughs> a lot of mad campers. <laughs> uh, so it was a baptism by fire. Uh, or water, as the case may be. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so we owned the campground for 15 years and sold it in October of 21 to our corporate headquarters. Uh, we were a KOA campground. That very first year, uh, we did 3,999 nights. So in the world of owning a campground, um, camper nights is one of your metrics. That's one unit on a site for one night. And uh, so we had just shy of that 4,000 camper nights and we did $184,000 in gross revenue. I was very excited that we were able to pay our bills that year and um, continue marching forward. Over the 15 years, we did five expansions. Um, we started out with 105 sites, uh, 100 were RV sites and five were rustic cabins. Over that 15 years, we added up to, we were up to 164 sites, I believe. 22 of those were deluxe accommodations or glamping units, if you will. We had a mix of um, rustic cabins with no bathrooms, uh, cabins that had bathrooms, some that slept four, six, eight, and uh, teepees. We had three teepees. On average, over that 15 years, we um, did about 12% increases year over year. And mm -hmm. when we sold uh, in 2021, we were just shy of 17,000 camper nights and one and a half million in gross revenue. Fantastic. If you think about that in Michigan, so this is one of the things just to kind of lock away. In Michigan, you're, we're only open six months out of the year. Lion's share of your business is going to happen between Memorial Day and Labor Day. And so we did that of that 17,000 probably 12,000 of it was in the in three months time. That is oftentimes what a, a park that's down south that's kind of a snowbird park might do in a whole year. So rocking and rolling, you know, for, for those six months. Um, this is a, just a lot of statistics, so bear with me, but it kind of tells you the state of the campground industry within the last um, couple of years. 15,462 campgrounds in the U.S. As, as of 23, that's a 1.7% increase over 22. So, uh, you know, obviously new ones are being built. 92 million households will identify themselves as a camper. 58 million of those will have camped at least one time in the last year. Um, last year, 6.4 million new households camped for the first time. Hmm. 56% of RV owners say that they will use their RV the same or more this year, despite an economic downturn. 40% of campers travel for natural events. So for example, solar eclipse, you know, that will draw a lot of people. 36% of people travel for agritourism and or like culinary experiences. 80% of campers will try a new form of camping in the next year. So when you say new form of camping, that could be per a tenter decides to go in an RV or go into a cabin. Um, a cabin camper goes into an RV. Um, then over 10 million households took a glamping trip in 22. So obviously you all know that there is a huge push in this uh, industry for, for glamping and uh, or glamour camping, if you haven't heard of that. That's what it stands for. And so that is just, there, there's a lot of people moving into that arena. Uh, camping accounts for a third of the leisure travel in the United States and Canada. I mean, that's a lot. 
That's a lot when you think about it. Uh, RV owners spend the most number of nights camping. Obviously, they already own the RV kind of built in. They just need to hook up and go. COVID actually drove a whole new camper demographic. So you had all these people who couldn't leave their house, but suddenly camping is social distancing, out in nature, helps with mental health. And uh, so people who had never tried camping before suddenly were willing to go out there and give it a try and just opened up a whole new world and a whole new guest demographic that we hadn't had before. And then peer to peer options. I don't know how many people have heard of outdoorsy, RV share, RV easy. These are people who already own an RV and they uh, just like you Airbnb, maybe a room or a cabin out, um, your Airbnb and your your RV out. But this is a case of like, I call up and say, hey, I'm going to be in Nashville, Tennessee next week for a week with vacation. Um, You know, I'm looking around and seeing who has an RV that they're willing to take to the campground for me. I'm renting it from them for that week. And then they come back and pick it up and I pay them rent for it. So I still have the site fee of the campground, but I'm renting the RV versus having to buy it. Wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't know there was such a thing. Yeah, it's a it's a very hot market, very hot market. And it's a nice way to like use your art, you know, make money off your RV when you're not using it. Um, There's kind of a new terminology, the urban dweller. This is the person that's typically, you know, in the cities. They don't have access to a lot of parks, nature, uh, preserves, and they are the ones that kind of have, are part of that new demographic from COVID. And they actually spend more nights per year camping. So these, and these, these can be people who own an RV, uh, but they live in the city. So of course they usually, you know, store it someplace else. They spend more money when they are on that, that vacation and they're more likely to acknowledge that camping offers mental health benefits and they usually are bringing their children along. And then kind of the biggest one is since 2014, the number of households who camp is is 100, has grown 174%. That's huge. Why is camping so popular? People identify it with emotional and mental well-being. Um, access to technology has completely changed the ability. Before you had to put in for the time off, you left, you went to your vacation for three days or a short weekend or for a week, left work behind. Now with um, many of the campgrounds having high-speed Wi-Fi, somebody can go work from their trailer. Kids are having fun on vacation. Dad or mom get to spend the evening playing around. Um, Generally speaking, it's still the most cost-effective way to take a vacation. For if you own your RV, $150 or less per night, You know, if you're taking a cabin, $250, $300 a night in a cabin, um, you're going to get an experience that you're not going to get at a hotel. I'm sorry, my throat is really dry. And then um, some of the things that campers are looking for right now is definitely that reliable Wi-Fi, because then they can work from there if they so choose. They can stream on their TV at night. A lot of them are looking for some kind of... um, On-site recreation. This can be anything from just a nice playground to organized activities and events. Um, They're looking for a convenience store for the things that they forgot, bread, milk, salt, pepper, things of that nature, Um, and food, ice cream, pizza, wings, simple stuff, easy to provide, but they still want to have it, you know, when they get there. The next thing to consider would really be your um, franchising versus independent ownership. And so in the United States, um, there's two main franchises, KOA and Jellystone. KOA stands for Campgrounds of America. Uh, KOA has approximately 525 um, franchises throughout the United States and Canada. About 50 of those are corporate owned. And then Jellystone has around 85 um, franchises within the United States. I'm not sure how many of those are corporate owned. 
Uh, some pros to having a franchise. You're not starting from scratch. So you kind of have a ready built in process. Um, they usually provide some form of training. So for example, KOA has what they call KOA University. They fly into Montana. You spend a week there, you're learning everything about running a KOA and their standards. Um, you have a built-in following. So of course, both Jellystone and KOA have uh, loyalty cards and people who are loyal to them will drive past other campgrounds to get to the next KOA or the next Jellystone. They both provide reservation software systems that typically feed into your accounting software and uh, allow you to take online reservations, which is hugely important to have. Um, more and more people are making their reservations online by themselves. And interestingly, more people will upgrade themselves uh, to a more expensive site when they make their reservation online versus if they talk to you over the phone. Both it, it's because they can set up the map and kind of pick their location. And so they want the the spot that's closer to the water or, you know, whatever it may be closer to the yeah, bathroom. Or, yeah. So you can yeah. say the same things to them on the phone and they're usually like, eh, no, I'll go middle of the road. The minute they go online and look at it for themselves, um, automatically they tend to go more expensive. My, my most expensive sites always sold before everything else. Um, both of them provide a national marketing. So you're gonna flyers, magazines, um, cat, you know, catalogs, uh, uh, what is the, the, the big guy, uh, Camping World. Uh, you know, they advertise with them and put their, their collateral inside their new RVs and stuff. They also will assist you with local marketing, either through things like providing you templates to market locally, um, sometimes they'll help you with verbiage or coupons, bounce back things. Um, they provide you with websites, which they maintain, um, that have the software system on there for people to both see mobile uh, and, and as well as on the uh, PC. And then search engine optimization is just huge. I mean, you and I both know that unless you're an expert in that area, it takes a while to build that up. And so KOA and Jellystone have really figured out, I don't know if you've heard of things like geofencing, but literally mm -hmm. if you're camping and your phone knows that you've been looking for campgrounds, um, if in KOA's system, it'll know that you're coming near a, a, a KOA and it'll start popping up, you know, that you're near the KOA, make a reservation now type thing. So it, it targets you. Um, both of them provide best practices. They have standards across their system. So they send in inspectors every year to make sure that you're holding to those standards. If you're not, they give you 30, 60, 90 days to come up to standard and correct whatever the infraction might be. Um, they oftentimes have more buying power with vendors uh, because they are, you know, they're directing all of their people to buy from them. Uh, we talked about the SE. Ooh. SEO advantage. And I've got this down here where I can't see. Um, and the other thing is, is that franchised campgrounds will typically sell for more than an independent campground. Um, cons, obviously you have a franchise buy-in fee. Uh, KOA, if you buy a campground that is a KOA and you're going to keep it a KOA, the new owner, there's a $7,500 transfer fee so that you know the new owner owns a franchise. If you're not a KOA and you wanna convert into one, it's a $30,000 fee. Of course, with that, you're getting, again, the, the advertising, they're gonna do all kinds of collateral to tell the world that you are now a KOA and that you're out there, um, <clears throat> as well as provide you with the website and the reservation stuff. Um, you're paying royalties. Uh, in KOA, it's 10%, but it's 10% of your registration revenue. So anything mm -hmm. you make in your store, off your amenities or activities is yours to keep. In Jellystone, <clears throat> I think it's 6%, but it's 6% on everything, every dollar that passes through. 
um, standards have to be adhered to within the system. So there's not a lot of room for individuality. Um, if they adopt something new, you're kind of forced into that new system. Uh, oftentimes you can't opt out of it. And if you have a franchise agreement and you decide to sell or you want out, you're going to have to buy out your contract. So, Linda, when you started, did you start right off as being a KOA campground or is that something that you transitioned into? No, um, what we did is we actually took a survey trip in 2004 um, all the way out to um, Yellowstone and back. And we stayed in a different KOA the whole way. So at the time, um, Jellystone was losing market share. Mm -hmm. KOA was kind of gaining market share. Um, we had always, I had grown up being a state park camper. So all I knew was state parks um, and we never stayed at KOAs because they were expensive. Um, so we had debated, do we want to do Jellystone, KOA or independent? We were highly concerned with the fact that there was a KOA um, about 20 minutes south of us. So obviously somebody was branded near us. Um, this area is high tourist, so there was lots of campgrounds in the area, and uh, trying to build that initial client base was concerning to us. So we decided that we were leaning towards KOA, took that survey trip, liked the fact that we saw the consistency among the campgrounds. You could tell that people had a, had a base of what to expect, right. and um, we liked the support that we were getting from the home office. Um, and that uh, the owners were telling us about. So that's, we we went up right away with a KOA franchise. Um, if you're an independent, obviously you don't have a franchise fee. You don't have royalties. You can operate your campground any way you want. You know, doesn't matter what, what you decide to do, how your buildings look, what your colors are, what your logo is, you can do what you want. Um, you're not alone. Most campgrounds, 15,000 campgrounds, um, I can't remember how many of those are uh, state parks and national parks, probably around uh, between six and 10,000, I think it was. Um, so you're not alone, you know, 525 or KOA, 85 or Jellystone. So there's a ton out there that are just independent. There's some smaller um, franchises, like there's one called Sun Communities, um, Fun in the Sun. So there's some smaller, I would call them real estate investment firms that own portfolios of campgrounds. Um, they're not necessarily branded. They have their kind of their own little bit of branding, but not what KOA and, and Jellystone are. Um, there is a national organization called RVAC. Um, it's uh, American Recreational Vehicle I can't remember what the C stands for. Um, and they provide a lot of information. Um, all three, Jellystone, uh, KOA, and RVAC, they all have their own conventions every year. So opportunity to network with other campground owners, uh, find out what the latest and greatest is and best practices and things like that. Cons are, um, if you're starting out brand new, no client base. Um, if you're buying from somebody, you obviously you're dealing with the previous owner's reputation until you can kind of get the word out that that there's new management in town. Now, if the previous manager had a great reputation, great. But if not, um, you know, it can take a couple of years to overcome that. You're going to need to purchase reservation software. There's several types of software out there. Um, they all offer varying degrees of, um, you know, digital ability. The um, I ha I do have to say that probably Jellystone and KOAs is some of the better ones compared to some of the other stuff I saw out there. And oftentimes that reservation software, so within KOA, we didn't have to pay per reservation, but a lot of those other reservation softwares, not only are you purchasing it, but you are going to be paying a fee per transaction or reservation. So yeah. that can be anywhere from, I don't know, a dollar to sometimes two or three dollars. Unless you're an absolute whiz, you're probably going to have to hire out your marketing website and SEO to build that up. Um, and then you're going to have to rely on industry Facebook groups recommendations. And everybody has an opinion out there in those. But there's a lot of groups that you can you can get into. 
<clears throat> Next thing you wanna really think about is who's your demographic? What do you want your demographic? You can really design a campground to kind of look and feel whatever you want. Um, you know, do you want to attract families? Do you want to attract, you want an over 55 crowd that's quiet and laid back and it's just bingo and, you know, karaoke every once in a while? Do you want a nice mix? Um, are you going to cater to big rigs? You know, people pulling in in these, you know, 45 foot long motorhomes with double axle, three air conditioners, or are you going more for just tenters and cabin people? Um, do you want to offer upscale glamping opportunities? or traditional camping or a mix. And um, then you need to kind of think about where you're buying property. Um, is, are, your, are your guests gonna consider that a base camp where they're kind of there with their unit, but every day they're leaving, going to the national park, going to the museum, um, you know, going to some attraction nearby, or are you kind of out in the sticks? There's not a whole lot to do then you know they're going to stay there all day but if they're going to stay there all day you're going to have to provide amenities to entertain them mm -hmm. <clears throat> seasonal versus transient so a seasonal park can mean two things in the world of camping seasonal can be i'm open seasonally you know may to october uh, but generally speaking what we mean is uh it's the guest home away from home they, this is a park where people bring their RV, they leave the RV, and they come and go. Sometimes they may live there. There's a lot of people who, you know, they live in Florida or Texas in the winter in their RV. They bring it up. Uh, you and I see it a lot in Michigan. They bring their motorhome up, and they stay in their motorhome all summer in, in, mm -hmm. in a park. Oftentimes, they're going to pay their own electric. Um, usually, in a seasonal park, you don't need a lot of employees. Uh, you're not going to necessarily have an uh, open regular office hours. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a general store. These are people that, you know, they get their self set up and they're not worried about forgetting, you know, salt and pepper and ketchup and mustard and stuff. There's usually stores nearby. <clears throat> Positive is also income predictability. You know how many sites you have, you know how much you're selling each of them for. So doing your budget and your CapEx budget very easy to plan out what you can afford to do from one year to the next. Um, guests in a seasonal park, not always, but usually aren't expecting you to create an experience for them. This is like their cottage up north. Um, they're going to make their own fun. Um, and, you know, there is some campgrounds where they ask them to maintain their own lot, so they have to do their own mowing. So you really, depending on what you want, can get away with quite a bit. And yet it, it's kind of like a mid-term, long-term rental. They're taking care of everything. Does um, KOA and Jellystone allow that transient park lifestyle? Yes, yes, they do. Um, I What I've always said is if you have a, an established uh, seasonal park, and let's just say it's mostly seasonal or all seasonal, it's established, maybe you even have a waiting list. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of reason to want to franchise. Why, Why? if I already have a customer base, I've got a waiting list, I'm making money, you know, I'm turning people away. There's not a lot of reason for me to go franchise the campground. If I'm a, season, or a transient park, numbers are kind of struggling, lagging. I'm just having a hard time getting that customer base built up then franchising might really be an option. I mean, quite frankly, there's a lot of campgrounds that they will franchise and they will see a rather significant uptick in their customer base in year one, just because of franchising. Um, some of the downsides to a seasonal park, they can start looking very lived in. People build decks, okay. they put sheds, um, you know, they got the dog chain out there. Um, they start having the car with the tire off. Um, so depending on how you manage that park, um, it can begin to look more mobile home parkish um, yep. as opposed to um, a nice seasonal park. Uh, also a downside is if you have a headache guest, oftentimes you've got to wait till that season's over. You've closed the park down for the winter 
um, or their their lease or contract or licenses up before you can get rid of them. And then uh, in truth, like a long-term rental, the income can be significantly less than what you would see in a transient park. Um, transient parks, your typical guest is gonna be there two to four days. If you don't like them and they're a pain in the rear end, they're gonna be gone in two to four days. <laughs> you don't have to see them again. Um, your income can literally, literally be two to three times higher. So I'll give you a, a for example, in our area, a um, there is a park that has seasonal sites that are probably around $3,000. And there's one that's upwards of like $5,000. Okay. Um, my KOA back when I owned it, so two years ago, um, my sites in general were generating, I want to say seven to $15,000, depending on the site per season, each site was generating seven to $15,000. So there's a significant ups, upside to the transient side. Um, you can do bigger, you, you, you know, you can, you can go on your CapEx projects, you have a higher income, so you can do maybe bigger projects on the same token. You you don't know what you're getting each year. You can kind of go look at last year and say, well, we had this much business. We expect to have this increase, you know, build your budget from there. Resale value on a transient park is going to be higher because one of the things they look at is your income um, on the valuation. So even though you might have the same sites as a seasonal park, um, they already know that as a transient park, you can generate X dollars. Um, some of the downsides to a transient park, those guests expect an experience. The camper of today is much different than the camper of 20 years ago. Um, a transient park has higher staffing needs, depending on how many amenities you offer, um, you know, how many people we had on a, on a given Friday night, we would have a hundred units coming in on at times. So wow. we often had, you know, 10, 12 people working on a Friday night between our office, escorting people to site, our food service and stuff like that. Um, it's quite an operation. It was. We had about 26 employees uh, total. And, um, you know, like my front office on a Friday night had to have three people in the office and about three to four guys outside. Um you're going to typically have office hours in a transient because, you know, people are going to come and come and go at all hours um, and usually a small convenience store. You're going to have to take care of all the grounds. You're not going to get people to mow the lawn when they're there for two to four days. Um, and you can get away with you no, know, depending on the size of the park. On a seasonal park, you don't necessarily have to have a reservation software system. You, you could keep it in an Excel spreadsheet if you wanted to. Um, in a transient park, you're going to want reservation software. Um, additional considerations in owning the park. Um, like I said, today's camper has a lot higher expectations. They're not afraid to tell you that if you don't do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to give you a bad review. Um, they want Wi-Fi they can stream on, a swimming option, a convenience store, food, um, activities. Um, in seasonal parks, you want to think about the fact that in every county um, and state are going to be different. So you want to check with them. But we have always been told, uh, don't use a contract or a lease. Um, use a license. So let's say you have a headache camper. They're not following the rules or dogs running loose. Um, you want to get rid of them. You can revoke a license and get them out of there. But if you have a contract or a lease, you may have trouble getting them off the property or breaking that. Um, you don't want people to receive their mail and, and write your address, you know, and their lot number as the, where they're receiving mail. The minute they do that, they can establish residency and you become a landlord. Yeah. So, you know, we used, we, we had a very like 10 seasonals. Um, we basically always told them if, if you need to receive mail, you need to get a PO box at the local at the local post office. Um, 
if you're offering accommodations, glamping stuff, you definitely want to use pictures of the actual accommodation. So don't describe the accommodation, show a picture of one with, let's say, a loft in a front porch, and they get there and the computer selected for them a accommodation with no front porch and no loft. You will not hear the end of it, I can guarantee you. <laughs> um, whatever rules you make, you have to police. So if you're going to say no alcohol, you know, you're going to have to police that. Um, easier to do things like, you know, I used to tell people when they asked about alcohol, your fun ends when your neighbor starts complaining. Um, you know, so I don't care if you drink, I'm not, I'm not your mother, but if you're obnoxious and interrupting the guy next to you, um, then, you know, we're going to have a problem, uh, and definitely have appropriate liability insurance and umbrella policies and things like, uh, to keep in mind are those extra amenities, jumping pillows, trampoline basketball, climbing wall, some of those more extreme ones. Um, sometimes they can be harder to insure. So you definitely want to talk to your insurance company. They'll do it, but it can give you a significant increase in, in your, um, your premiums. Another thing to look at is owner operator versus hiring and management. Uh, it's a lifestyle choice if you're an owner operator. Uh, you have to like people. You're with them. It's kind of like 600 people showed up on Friday night and only 300 are leaving on Sunday. And uh, so you, it's 24-7 customer service while you're open. I mean, people will knock on your door in the middle of the night. You'll get phone calls. Um, so you, you need to like people. You like have to like hospitality. Expect to work long days and be involved in every aspect of the operations. If you don't know how to fix things, you're going to learn how to fix things because you can't hire everything out. A, a, it's hard to get subcontractors in there and B, sometimes it's just too expensive and you got to manage your, your funds. Um, as with a long-term rental, owning a campground is the appreciation game. Your, your customers are paying your mortgage payment along the way, but the real payoff comes when you sell the park. Um, and a very well-run campground making a profit can provide a, a very nice lifestyle with a lot of tax advantages. And I can just use my own personal experience of it. It provided our housing. We literally, I didn't have to pay utilities. I My car was owned by the campground. I mean, when we left the campground, um, somebody said, well, you need to establish a budget. And I said, I have no idea. I mean, you know, my lawn <laughs> care was $2,000 a month. Our electric bill was $7,000 a month. You know, our trash bill was $500, you know. So you there's a lot of tax advantage. All those things are write-offs. Um, our vehicles were so you can, you can get away with a lot, have a very nice lifestyle with it. Um, you're tied to it, but you can have a life, nice lifestyle as well. Um, and a manager op operated campground, uh, offers you the freedom to pursue other opportunities. Somebody else is taking care of business. They're taking the phone calls at night. You don't have to. Uh, you definitely want to hire the right person. Definitely. My husband used to tell the people we hired in, your job is to make my job easier. And if you're not, then I don't need you. <laughs> so make sure that the person you're bringing in truly can take over your role and to free you up to do other things. Uh, which can give you opportunities to do, you know, to to create other revenue streams. And then you can also hire third parties in. So there are companies, I think the one that I know of off the top of my head is called Blue Water. Uh, they will actually bring in a whole management team and manage the campground. And uh, you're literally just getting mailbox money that you're going to pay a hefty price for that, but no headaches and you can do other things. Funding, which is probably what everybody wants to know more than anything yeah. else, is typically when we got into the business, it was you needed about 30% down. Now um, you're needing closer to 35%. And a lot of the real estate investment groups and or single owners are attempting to come in with up to 50% down. The reason being is they're trying to improve their equity position because the interest rates 
have been hovering so high. Obviously, it's commercial, so that makes it up higher. Uh, I I spoke with the CFO. The, he just retired from KOA. He was the CFO. Uh, knew him very well, and um, we were talking about this, and he said he was stunned at how high interest rates were, but. Um, be that as it may, you, you want to try to improve your equity position to control that monthly payment. Campgrounds are kind of a weird animal to, to traditional banks. So for example, we had um, a loan officer through Chase Bank who worked with us really great and had our loan through Chase for probably five years. It was coming up as a balloon, so we had to refinance. I had... Uh, our, our uh, loan on auto pay. So it was never late. It was always paid in full. Our account had anywhere from two hundred fifty dollars to $300,000 in it in cash at all times. And it was around a million dollar loan. So who doesn't want that? I mean, great credit score. When it came time to refinance, he said, we're really not into campgrounds. We don't want to refinance. I was stunned. I mean, I'm like, here I am like an A++ customer and you don't want to refinance. So oftentimes it's your local bank who you've banked with for years and really knows your character who will back it. Or there's some campgrounds out, or excuse me, some banks out there that they understand campgrounds. They specialize in it. It's their niche. And so they will work with you and they have all kinds of creative financing opportunities. The one that we worked with was called Independence Bank in Haver, Montana. Um, there's another one called Unity Bank in Wisconsin. And a lot of these campground brokers, they're probably aware of banks that will work with you. But for example, Independence Bank had built a system called Go With The Flow because they were also very familiar with working with farmers. So okay. if you don't know what Go With The Flow is, you would have payments in the season as you were open. And in the winter, they would susp suspend payments until the next season when you open back up. Now you're still paying, you're still having interest accrue on that, but for campgrounds or people who are just getting into the business and maybe you don't have enough cash flow to get through uh, in those first couple of years, that is the, a great type of uh, financing to let you get on your feet. Valuation when you're buying and selling, um, assets, income, and goodwill. Um, I actually, I, I knew it, I kind of knew what Goodwill was, but I looked it up to get a definition in case people were not really familiar. It's kind of like that intangible thing. Like, you know that there's value to that, but you, you, there's nothing to say, like, here's your asset and here's your, and that has value. So you take the fair market value of a business's identifiable assets um, and you subtract that from the fair, from the price paid for the acquired business. And that becomes your Goodwill. When you're selling a campground, sellers like to attribute more to goodwill because it reduces their tax liability. Um, the CFO that I talked to, uh, he said that in 22, these are the these are the multipliers that they would look at. So typically, they're going to run all these multipliers, and they're going to uh, kind of look for either outliers in there or you know take an average. So six and a half times your registration revenue five and a half times times your gross income because you may have like a store in there as well. 5.8 times your gross profit, 13 times your net operating income. And then they're going to look at EBITDA. And if you don't know what EBITDA is, it's the earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, amortization. And it's kind of like a measure of the overall performance and operating cash flow that a campground would have prior to paying the bank. Um, things to consider if you're going to build new, and we're coming to the end here. So, uh, zoning, if you're going to build brand new, um, and you're not zoned properly for it in the area, you know, you're not probably going to want to buy that property till you know, you can get that zoning change. You don't want to be stuck with 30 acres of property that can't be zoned for what you need it for. You want to look at expansion potential. Part of that is a, you may want to expand B. When you go to sell a campground and the buyer's coming in to look at it, their bank is going to be looking at, well, they're paying X dollars. For example, the market's really hot right now. They're paying X dollars for that. 
Are they going to be able to expand it to make more money? So if you have got something that's landlocked, you, you've done everything you can possibly do to it, then essentially someone coming in doesn't have a lot of potential to increase that income. So you want to look at expansion potential. Um, what utilities are already close by? Is there fiber running nearby that you can get cable and or Wi-Fi? Um, I can tell you right now, it's like Comcast. Um, and I don't know if Comcast is everywhere or just in our part of the world, but they wanted um, something to the tune of $5,000 a foot or it was a ridiculous amount of money uh, to do it. So you want to know what utilities are nearby. Um, do you have to tap into a, a city sewer? Um, sometimes it's a $150 fee. Sometimes it's a $150,000 fee. Uh, do you have to put a septic uh, system in? How are you going to build that client base? If you're independent, you know, be prepared to have somebody that's going to be doing the website, getting it out there, letting people know. How many decision points are between you and the nearest major highway? The more decision points that a customer has to make to get to you, the less likely they are to come. All right. So if you're eight miles off the highway and they got to make eight turns to get to you, that becomes confusing. They're out in the middle of nowhere. If you're literally two miles off the exit, straight down the road, more likely to capture that cu the customers. Um, who's your neighbors? Do you have a railroad nearby? Um, do you have an event venue that maybe they let them party till one o'clock in the morning and boozing it up and music and that's going to keep your campers who just left the city and the noise to come out and see the stars and the quiet. Um, do you have farmers nearby? They could be crop dusting. They could be going with their tractors, kicking up lots of dust. Do you have a neighborhood nearby that's going to complain that your campground's too loud for them? Um, marketing, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Financing and down payment. Oftentimes, the, a bank is going to want to see the property, the land already paid for. Um, land generally, on average, is around $3,000 an acre. Um, again, down payment for construction costs, you know, you're going to have to come in with that third down, you know, of the entire project. Uh, cost to, per site to build. So when you look at cost per site, it can be fifteen dollars to $50,000, depending on the, the park. A $15,000 per site is probably, you know, you've got your pedestal, your water and electric, you know, water, sewer and electric, gravel roads, and maybe one building that has your office in your, your bathhouse. If we start adding in cement, asphalt, activity building, things of that nature, you're gonna, your, your price is going to start to go up. Um, for best revenue, uh, you're going to want to have a minimum of 75 to 90 sites. We were told early on when we did it, anything under 100 sites wasn't going to necessarily break even. Anything under 80 sites was considered a hobby campground. So if you're going to wow. do it, you're probably going to want to make the effort to be at that 100 mark um, in order to turn the type of dollars you need to do what you need to do. Um, other costs would be, again, your insurance and your amenities. So in that 15 to 50, it is not including insurance and amenities that you would add on top of the basic for building a campground. If you're buying an existing campground, um, again, you want to look at the expansion potential. How old are the facilities? Is the electrical infrastructure modernized or is every site 20 and 30 amp? Is everybody sharing a pedestal? Or are they sharing a water hookup? Um, are you going to have to come in and immediately place, replace roofs? Or can you ride out for a couple of years um, on what's already in there? Um, again, looking at the neighborhood, uh, if it's a seasonal park, uh, is it look lived in? Is it not well kept? Are there headache people that you're inheriting? And again, then you're going to look down at your financing and down payment. Um, it has lower startup costs find uh, a, an existing park, uh, but you may have more maintenance down the road. People, well, because we built brand new, um, we knew where all the lines were, water lines, electric right. lines, things of that nature. And so all of our friends in the business who bought existing parks, they would always say, you know, oh, we went to dig something and we, we 
busted a water line or, you know, something of that nature. So just different things to, to consider. Um, I did take a lot of my statistics from the North American Camping Report. That's out there for anybody to read. It's uh, KOA sponsors this, but they they pay for an independent group to do it. Um, hundreds and hundreds of people are um, interviewed for that report. They've done it for 10 or 12 years now, and it's actually considered the foremost report on the camping industry. Um, regularly, uh, the, the CEO of KOA comes into the um, Mecca down here, RV Hall of Fame, uh, South Bend, Indiana, to report on that every year. And then, of course, I talked with the CEO, former CEO of, of Campgrounds of America. And here's my, uh, all my family here. My, uh, the triplets are the, uh, the left lo and the lower two. And then, and so that is my daughter, Katie, on the left, my son, Tommy, in the middle, my daughter, Michaela, and then our son, Josh, on the upper right. And uh, they are my why. That's awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. So any questions? What can I what can I answer for you or or send so, you in the right direction? Libby, I really like the idea that you you had in mind you wanted to build a campsite. And rather than just start knocking down trees and, and laying out a plan, you, you took a road trip and started yeah. looking at different campsites and uh figuring out you a franchise or not? I'm sure that was a big discussion. And we kind of went down that road and said, okay, look at KOAs. They're all kind of had the same theme and feel to them. And that was something that appealed to you. Did they help you lay out a design for your park? Did they provide yes. you engineering? So the really nice thing with, and I think Jellystone does this too, KOA and Jellystone. So when we called KOA and said, hey, we want to do a franchise, the first thing they did was fly somebody out to look at the property to see um, if they thought it was a, a good place to put a park. Uh, meaning they looked at how many decision points were between the main highway and us. Um, they looked at the topography of the property. And once they kind of gave a go ahead and said, yeah, we think this would be a good location, we went ahead and, and made the purchase. But then they actually helped with the design and layout. They have a, KOA has a design department. So I think there's probably maybe some more amenities with KOA than Jellystone, but that could have changed. Um, a year ago, Sun Communities bought um, Jellystone. And so now Sun Communities, while they don't have a branding of 525 parks, they have a very large portfolio. I think it's in the 400, if you include their Jellystones and and what else they own. So they they know you don't wanna flippantly just go design what you think looks good to you. Um, you have to take in consideration turning radiuses, how mm -hmm. RVs need to move in and out on angles, um, you know, pull throughs versus back ends, um, you know, the, the width between sites, typically you're gonna want anywhere from 30 to 40 feet from pedestal to pedestal. So there's a lot of things to take into account there. If you're going to um, an engineer to or an architect to lay it out for you that is not with either one of those, um, then I would highly recommend seeking out somebody who has um, actually done campground design before. And if you have the ability to kind of take a look at their designs or even visit parks that they've designed, um, it would definitely behoove you. It's one of those things that put a good amount of um, research into into that uh, design because once once it's the the wires are in the ground, um, it becomes a pain in the butt to change your mind. Yes, and expensive as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, what kind of time frame was it? Um... When you put that first shovel in the ground to start your construction until you are ready to start receiving um, clients? Um, I would say a year. I mean, we, we actually had started the excavation of the roads and that's when our financing fell through. And so we had to stop because there was no money. We had functioned at that point <clears throat> on the money from the sale of our home. 
So we had to stop and seek out financing. And it took us almost a year to get financing again, because like I said, campgrounds are kind of a strange animal now. It, they're a little less strange now than they were, you know, 15, 20 years ago, but still can be a, a challenge. Um, but I would plan on a year, um, you know, lining up your subs and, and things of that nature. And of course, if you're restricted due to weather, you know, in Michigan, yeah. you're not going to be laying lines in, in the middle of winter. And did you have to have quite a bit of capital reserves? during that construction period to, to, to make the payments or is that some of that deferred? So what I, at the time, my business acumen was a lot more elementary, but what really um, helped us is that the bank that we worked with initially, um, they financed the construction. So it was on draws. But inside the loan, when we closed, they gave us, I want to say, six or 12 months of payments. Got so it. in other words, they gave us the money and we turned around and would give it back. Give it back yeah. And of course, we're paying interest on that. But the point being is that we didn't have to dig into our personal funds in that first two, you know, and actually we didn't have to dig into our personal funds ever. Um, from day one, outside of our initial, uh, I want to say we had initial three hundred twenty-five thousand dollar investment, um, which netted me six point one million when we sold. So, I mean, you can—it's definitely something to think about getting into. Uh, I remember telling my husband when he said, "Oh, it's at least worth five and a half million. And I was like, "There's no way!" <laughs> <laughs> and a year and a half later, um, so you know, I, I would plan on a year. I would try to see if a bank, if you, especially if you're going to be an independent, um, I would try to see if a bank would be willing to give you the funds for the payments for that first year until you can get established on your feet, get a reputation, get your marketing out there, you know, have enough funds to do the things you need to do to let the world know you exist. When you are, and, and it's a little out of your boathouse because you built and operated your park. But yes. if someone was to go over and evaluate and look at buying a park, from your perspective, how daunting of a task is that as far as relying on someone else to run your park? How, you mean if you said buying it or or having a manager? Yeah, buying a park that's that you're not planning on being there on a daily basis, right? So you're buying a park that is remote, um, like Alaska or something. Yeah. <laughs> I think that I think the first thing I would look at is, is it a well-run park right now? Do they have a manager in place that wants to stay on? Um, somebody who already knows it. Um, if not, then I would start looking at um, finding someone who has experience in managing parks and, you know, be willing to to pay for that because a mismanaged park um, can become a nightmare really fast. Um, and you can have an unhappy manager leave in the middle of the season. And then you're out there trotting around trying to buy your mobile home parks. And now one of the three of you has to head to Alaska for the rest of the season and figure out how to run the park. Um, right. I would say it would be important to have a good understanding of the inner workings of that park. Um, a, to know if the amount of funds that are showing up are the real funds to make, you know, a lot of people paying cash and you don't want to make sure that cash isn't disappearing. Um, yeah. you want to have a lot of your policies and procedures in, in place as to how you're going to run it, how you're going to do refunds, um, how you're going to take reservations, how money is going to be handled. Um, you're going to want access to seeing the books and the reservation software. So what is being told to you and what you're seeing in the bank matches up with, you know, what you're, you're seeing on the other side. Um, there are people and like I said, third party management companies that'll come in and take care of it. But there's also managers out there that'll, you know, they've done other parks and, you know, their dream could be to go to Alaska for the summer and, right. and be there. Um, but you have to have somebody who's going to open the park up in some place like that. You know, they're going to flush the lines. 
They're going to open it up. They know how to do that. And you need somebody who knows how to close that park down, blow out the lines, make sure everything's put away for the winter and you're not going to have problems or bears getting in or, you know, whatever. Well, excellent. I'll just keep quiet for a minute and I'll open the, the chat up, see if anybody else has any questions. Please come on and ask Libby. This is a great opportunity. Yeah, actually, uh, Libby, I have a question. If you were to do it all over again, would you build or buy? Great question. I think right now, um, it, you know, a lot of things can affect your, it can be age, season of life, you know, that you're in. Yeah. I, I think I probably would look for a park that is not operating at capacity that needs an injection of some capital, um, needs some better marketing and better management to bring it up to par. And um, because A, you already have a client base, so you, you can have a reasonable expect, expectation of the income you're going to have coming in that first year. And um, you're going to be able to uh, know right out of the gate, like what needs to be fixed or what do I need to deal with? But you really want to do good inspections, really good due, due diligence. How old is their septic system? Is it up to par? How old is their electrical system? How old are the electrical panels? Uh, do those need to be replaced? Um, you, you, you want to look at those type of things because a failing septic system in the middle of the season when you've got 40 to 100 units on site um, instantaneously becomes a problem. Uh, wow. A water leak instantaneously becomes a huge problem. So you need to have processes in place that will help you take care of that. But I, I, I would say existing would be the way I would go right now. It's, it's very costly to build at this time. The materials are so expensive, so expensive. Yeah. Um, uh, steel is through the roof. Yeah. I stay, uh, you know, I I have an RV and we travel around the lot and we usually stay at KOAs because I do have two young kids, right? And so mm -hmm. we always look for those those parks that have playgrounds that usually have the events. And um, most of the KOAs I've ever stayed at have been wonderful, except one. There was mm -hmm. one KOA that I would never, ever, ever stay again. Um, but yeah, I mean, KOA is, uh, you know, they do, they do top notch. Yeah. Yeah. And and think go ahead. Melissa has a great question here. She's asking um how would you go about finding an existing park? How would I go about buying an existing park? Finding. Finding. Um well, there's definitely brokers out there who specialize in parks. Uh you know, so you can contact them. Um I know like I regularly go on to RV parks for sale. Uh, Michigan parks for sale. I, I mean, I still keep an eye out on it every once in a while to see. So that's one way. Um, drive around, look for parks, look for parks that seem run down, parks that seem to have older owners operating it, you know. Um, they, they, they're watching TV in between customers coming in, you know, and they're, they're not, uh, they, they don't look like they're that enthused about running the park anymore. And, uh, you know, look at tossing a number or seeing if they're interested in, in getting rid of it and not dealing with it anymore. You think there's a business model there of taking a, a mom and pop run campsite that needs some love, like you said, needs an injection of funds and bringing them into the Jellystone or the KOA umbrella and bringing them up the standards and the. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Happens all the time. All the time, there there is oftentimes what they'll have what will happen is when you approach them to see if you can come into the franchise, they'll send they will send their inspectors out uh, to take a look at the park, and then they'll come back to you and say these are all the things that need to be done be before we'll allow you to have a franchise. So sometimes it does take parks anywhere from a year to three or four years, depending on their um, income, to get those. Um, those things in place in order to be able to uh, join the franchise. 
and it's just a matter of how much capital is required to inject uh, to fix those deficiencies mm -hmm. versus the park paying for them as you go, right? That's at that time frame versus income. Right. Yeah. Right. right. But they, they both have, um, you know, they're there to help because they want to increase their market share. Yeah. So oftentimes they will, you know, they're, I don't know about Jellystone. Actually, Jellystone will actually work with you on financing, I believe I read. Um, KOA, basically, you have to go find your own financing. They're not going to mess with the financing piece of it. That's up to you. Okay. Yeah. But that that Independence um, Bank in Haver, Montana, they have a very close relationship with KOAs. They almost... I mean, they will do independent parks, but they have a very exclusive relationship with KOAs and actually give better rates to people who are KOAs. Probably see a better success rate and better it, income. It, yeah, rate. there's a it's a just a better, more reliable business model in their in their mind. So, what, what's the one thing that you'd say was was like the difficult part of operating the park? Was it managing? Um, reservations was it the personnel was it uh, just the day-to-day -day operations of maintenance in the park um i you know that's almost a question that i have to say what was my most biggest frustration and what was my husband's <clears throat> because he basically took care of anything outside i took care of everything inside um i'd say the hardest thing to do is if you are if you are seasonal, and when I say seasonal, I mean May to October. Okay, yeah. um, you only have employees for six months. Now, I don't know if all of you have heard of work campers, um, and there's different websites you can go on. These are people who travel full time. Typically, um, they want to go and work in exchange for their site, or they want to be paid, uh, but they don't want to work more than part time. So you're giving up site rent or revenue in exchange for their work. Plus they usually get some pay along with it. And um, that can be challenging because these are people that they're only there for a few months. So you have this ramp up of training them in your processes, how your software works. And then they kind of get proficient about right around the peak of the season. And then, you know, they need to leave in the fall and you know, they, they want to do this to travel, so they don't want to come back again. Um, occasionally, you cross the person who uh, definitely loves you. They love the area, and they want to come back every year and do that. So to me, that really, as time wore on year after year, became more and more of a frustration um, because they are only there for a few months. Also, I found that sometimes they had less... Um, it's interesting how when they're living in their RVs and then they, this work camper doesn't like this work camper and now we get attitudes and I'm not going to work with them. And <laughs> it's like, it's like second graders all over again, you know? <laughs> um, but I would say that was probably my biggest frustration. Um, the second one would be you know, you get to the middle of the season, you're exhausted. I mean, I, I was, you know, running by 730 in the morning and sometimes not done till 11 o'clock at night. Um, part of that, I would say, was we didn't have a regular manager in place. And I think a manager would have assisted in alleviating some of that stress on me. So like looking backwards, I would have told myself to get a manager in there much sooner than what we did. Uh, we had one the last couple of years, but that I worked with. So I was still intimately involved, but I worked with it. Um, my husband would say probably just people who were not, um, they would tell you they know how to do all these things and then you get them there. And, you know, he's saying, go drive the tractor and, they don't know how to drive a tractor, you know. We had we had a guy that owned his own lawn company, <laughs> lawn care business. He ran over more sewer connections, broke more <laughs> sewer connections, you know, hit somebody's trailer. Um, we had one work camper dump our zero turn, ten thousand dollar zero turn into our pond. Oh no, um, you know, so that you you run into those kind of 
fun little things. The joys of owning your own business. Yeah, Gina has a question. Hey, Libby. Um, I so I'm more so interested in doing like smaller scale boutique, you know, glamping. Mm -hmm. You know, buy some acreage. Probably have my primary residence there, and then like a separate designated area for glamping. Mm -hmm. Um. So a decent amount of acreage. But anyway, so I guess it would kind of be more, I guess, more Airbnb style in that regard. Do you have any thoughts on that as a strategy or like any issues you would foresee with that kind of setup? Um, I think you still want to make sure that your zoning is um, able to you know, let's just say you are part of a, a neighborhood, um, mm -hmm. you know, are they going to allow you to put cabins back there? Um, it depends on if your township or um, city council looks at those things as permanent structures, or are they, you know, the, the ones on wheels? Um, right. Are they, you know, a cabin on skids or do they have like a foundation and they're permanent? I mean, all those things change how it's looked at from a tax perspective and a zoning perspective. Uh -huh. um, there's a lot of people who are very successful at that. Um, you might want to look up um, Fields of Michigan, F-I-E-L-D-S, Fields of Michigan. Mm -hmm. That's local here. Um, she has a farm and they decided to put glamping tents up and have turned that into quite the glamping experience. They offer things like yoga sessions and right. um, food that they make that's like all farm to table. Right. Um, so, and, and it's been a very successful business model for her. Um, uh -huh. Because that's so, kind of what I'm talking about, like that sort of thing. Do you know if she's zoned a certain way? You'd have to call her and find out because it's going to be different depending on where you live. Right. So like I might not, if I'm just, you know, on a bunch of land, you know, I don't, I wouldn't be residential. It'd be rural, I guess, but I might, well, it need might to be just agricultural. Check. It could be industrial. It could be commercial could be residential. Right. So you need to look at the zoning. Maybe you have a, like our, our zoning designation was agricultural and we had to get a special designation that said agricultural was spe special land use permit. I see. Okay. The so other that would be the most important thing kind of for me to yeah. understand in that type of situation. Yeah. You don't want to start slapping them up until you've kind of gone to your city council <laughs> and, and ask them, you know, this is my plan. And in, in doing so, um, I, you know, you might want to see if you can feel them out before you put a lot of effort into it, but you also want to be really prepared because the questions they're going to ask is, well, how many people are you going to have there? How many cars will be going through? How long will they stay? Um, you know, what are you doing for them? Um, the mm -hmm. other thing is if you're providing food, you're going to have to get a food service license. Um, right. You're going to, you need to find out how many um glamping tents cabins whatever it is that you can have before you're considered a campground i believe mm -hmm. in michigan you can have if you're if it's under 10 you're not considered a campground but the minute you get to 10 cabins you're considered a campground um, i see you need to find out if your local convention and visitors bureau um is gonna also has a tax so for example um, we, Michigan has a state use and lodging tax that I tack on that I have the customer pay of 6%, but then our convention and visitor bureau also has a 6% tax. So I had to make sure I was collecting that and sending that into the convention and visitors bureau. So those are the kind of things that, cause you don't want to end up not collecting that. And then they come back to you and say, well, according to your books, you know, you've been renting these out for two years now you're going to go back and give us all this money but you never pay back taxes yeah right okay it can be a very really successful model it can be very labor intense um you know when in in your peak season um let's just say you have 10 um and let's just say it takes 30 to minutes to an hour to clean them um you know you've got 10 that's 10 hours of work 
So you've got to have people to come in and clean, um, somebody to wash all the sheets, somebody, you know, you're going to have to have usually standard is two and a half par of linens for each accommodation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so you're going to have to think through all of those things as well. Uh, these cabins and cottages that are on wheels, uh, park models, they range in price depending on how small they can be $50,000 to $150,000. Those, um, I call them woody tents, but somebody else bought them now, um, tent masters. Uh, they have those platforms with the canvas tent and the poles, and mm -hmm. they actually have bathrooms in those too. Um, oh, wow. And those range in price, I think, from thirty to fifty thousand dollars. There's another one called Echo Structures, kind of a, a futuristic looking one. Um, you have the bell tents. Um, you have teepees. You just and you also want to look at the longevity of the canvas, um, and then your furnishings for them. So, right. still a lot of money to go into it still can be a very successful business model, but you right. need something that attracts people to your area for it. Mm -hmm. Right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank you so much to me for your time. I greatly yeah. appreciate it. I love hearing all the details of your story. We've kind of known some of that, but not in such great detail. So greatly appreciate it. All right. And all right. Uh, Love you that you shared your family with us too. So yes, thank, thank you, Liv. So I'm gonna yeah. be picking your brain. Pardon me? I said I'm gonna be calling and picking your brain a That's lot. Great. That's great. That's great because um uh, it's something that Shane and I are very interested in getting into. Um, so yes, we we keep talking about it. We just need to find the right park to do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. good luck, and I don't know. Maybe I'll be interested to do it with you. It depends on where it is. Yeah. All right. We'll keep you posted. Sounds or wonderful. I'll consult, or I'll consult if nothing else. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, you Perfect. can you be our consultant. Consultant for that. Thank you so much, Libby. Yeah. I really appreciate you, and thank you everyone for coming tonight. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much.